if there's some part of you that just feels like it's gonna explode out of you and you can't hold it back, that's a pretty good sign that this is something you should pursue. If you come back from your first Western elk hunting adventure and you feel like your expectations were not met and you are disappointed, then man, you are missing the point. Little tiny steps done over and over and over again build to something that uh, can be pretty great. For a lot of the people that are in front of the camera, you're spending a whole heck of a lot of your time not hunting. There's a whole lot of baloney that you might not want to do. I saw it as something that I had no right to do. Maybe it will fail. Maybe I won't be able to get a publisher. Maybe it's going to be horrible, but I decided that I had to try it. This is Mark Kenyon from Wired to Hunt and Meat Eater, and you're listening to The Wild Initiative. Put down your latte and pull on your boots. I would rest at peace for eternity if my legacy was that I made a positive influence on the non-hunting public about what hunters are and what hunting is. I finally got my buck on our last real day of hunting. So a pro-hunting organization is voting against hunting. And that says anti-hunting to me. There was a year straight where I was averaging up to 200 death threats a day. And I hugged it. Like, I just wanted to hug a bear. It's proven that the average steak in a grocery store touches 50 to 100 hands and machines. And we're putting that into our body. Hey, y'all, Cable Smith, host of the Lone Star Outdoors show here. This is Adam Weatherby. I'm Corey Jacobson with Elk 101. This is Christy Titus. Hey, folks, this is John Bear. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. All right, y'all, welcome to another episode of The Wild Initiative. Today, I am lucky enough to sit down with the one and only Mark Kenyon of Wired to Hunt and now Meat Eater as well. Mark, thanks so much. I'm really glad we were able to uh, finally make this happen. We were playing a bit of email tag for a while there. Yeah, yeah. thanks for the patience <laughs> there. I'm glad, glad to be here. Glad we can chat. Well, you know, it's not like we both live busy lives or anything, and it's not like yes. you just had a child or anything. Yeah, that's <laughs> got a way of throwing wrenches into things, that's for sure. <laughs> just want to say a big congratulations to you and the wife for that. That's awesome, man. Thank you, thank you. So one thing I always like to start out with is just kind of a general introduction of of who you are, uh, you know, and also how did you really get your start in hunting, fishing, the outdoors? Yeah. So, uh, I guess I'll start there with how I got my introduction, my introduction to the outdoors. And then I'll kind of explain what I do now. Um, I was born into a hunting and fishing family. So from the, from right out of the gate, I was taken fishing with my grandpa and dad and uncles at age three. I was going up to our family deer camp. Uh, our vacations were not Disneyland or Mexico or Hawaii or Chicago or New York City. Our vacations were going to a local campground or going to the lake or going to the cabin. Um, so that was kind of all we did and all I knew. So I grew to just love this stuff deep, deep down in my core. And that continued as I grew into a young man and an adult, um, taking that further and further and further. I became, you know, I really latched on to our family love of the outdoors and became very passionate for it as an individual. Um, eventually leading me to, after I graduated college, uh, deciding that I wanted to find some way to do this for the rest of my life uh, as, as my career. Um, so I started a website in my, during my, between my junior and senior year of college called Wired to Hunt. And over the subsequent, oh, five years, I slowly built that up and started writing for hunting magazines and, and built a, you know, a YouTube channel and a blog and a social media following and uh, a community of folks around Wired to Hunt until in 2013, I was able to quit my day job and go full time with Wired to Hunt, um, built out a podcast after that. And this is mostly focused on deer hunting, um, though I certainly speak to and, and participate in all sorts of other hunting and fishing activities. Um, and then was running that for another, I don't know, four years or so, and then merged Wired to Hunt with Meat Eater um, upon the expansion of the Meat Eater brand into a network. Um, so now Wired to Hunt is a podcast within the Meat Eater network, and I continue my writing for the Meat Eater website, and I host, uh, in addition to my Wired to Hunt podcast, I also host a new show we're uh, filming for Meat Eater, which is called The Back 40. Um, and then on top of all that, I also am a, uh, an author. I wrote a book called That Wild Country. Um, so I do a bunch of different things, but everything revolves around communicating about hunting, fishing, and conservation. That's at the core of, of everything I do. 
So, you know, we live kind of in the age where we were just talking about this before, you know, before we started recording, where it is fairly easy and accessible for anyone to to build a platform for themselves to get their message out. You know, we live in a world of, of for better or worse, uh, online influencers and this and that and the other. You know, you grew from this student with, you know, a love for the outdoors and hunting and fishing now to where it's a career and a very successful one. Um, what, uh, what advice might you give someone that, that has an interest in, in a career in the outdoors and, and finding a way to turn this passion of theirs into something they can live off of? Well, I think it, it's unfortunately a little bit cliche. Um, and it's because cliches often have a hint of, of truth to them. And I think what it comes down to is two things. First and foremost is simply, if you want to turn this into a career of some sort, you need to approach it as a career. You, you, can't, you have to change from this being like a fun little side hobby, if this is what you want, to then putting in the kind of work it takes to make something a real job. And so uh, that's not for everyone. I wouldn't recommend that for everyone. For a lot of people, it's probably better just to enjoy hunting and fishing, get out there, enjoy it. Um, but for some people, you're going to want to find a way to make it more part of your life, or there's going to be something deep dive down inside of you that is just screaming out of your chest saying, I need to share this, or I need to do this. Maybe that's talking about it. Maybe that's photographing. Maybe that is filming. Maybe that is whatever it might be. If there's some part of you that just feels like it's going to explode out of you and you can't hold it back, that's a pretty good sign that this is something you should pursue. And if you are going to do that, it just requires buckling down and putting the pedal to the metal and just grinding is as generic of advice. That is um, a lot of, I get this question all the time. How do you do it? How do you make in the hunting industry? How did you do what you do? What was the secret? And unfortunately there was no silver bullet. There was no like single thing I did. Um, it was just that I worked on it every single day for years and years and years and years. I started Wired to Hunt in 2008. So it's been a dozen years that I've been working my tail off to try to build this into a thing. Uh, working a full-time job while tr working essentially a full-time job's worth of work on Wired to Hunt in between all those hours. So waking up at 3.30 or 4 in the morning to work on it and then staying up late after, you know, uh, after the day job. Or I was writing a book while working a regular job. And so doing those two things at the same time, um, you know, it just, just if you love it enough, you're, you're willing to do that work and it doesn't feel always like work, but a whole lot, whole heck of a lot of the time it does feel like work. Um, so it just comes down to, if that's your goal, if you're really passionate about it, um, you have to approach it that way. And, and so really oversimplifying things here, this, the few simple steps I would take would be find what it is that you are screaming to do. What's like, what's deep inside you, whatever that thing might be, figure out what that is. And also look at what your skill sets are too. Um, usually if you're honest with yourself and self-aware, you can kind of see where you naturally might fit, where you naturally might have something that you're a little bit better at. Um, maybe you have an eye for photography. Maybe you, maybe you, um, you know, are, are more of a behind the scenes kind of person who can really help direct a story, um, whatever it is, find what your thing is, and then do it and do it and do it and do it and really work on fine tuning that craft, whatever it is. So for me, it's been a little bit of everything, but let's say writing was the first thing. Um, so so I just started writing and I, I had no education when it came to writing. I didn't go to school to become a writer. Um, I had like high school English and maybe like a single course of English in college. Um, but I realized I wanted to be a writer post-college. So I said, okay, I'm going to write every day. I'm going to write an article and I'm going to seek out every book I can find and every resource I can find. And I'm going to do everything I possibly can to teach myself. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to teach. I'm going to do it. I'm going to learn. I'm going to do it. I'm going to learn. I'm going to keep on doing that for years and years and years. So that's, that's step one. You could do that for any other medium. Step two is then connecting with other people. So you do your thing, you put it out there to the world. And then you connect with folks. So in my case, it was writing the blog, sharing it everywhere I possibly could be, and then trying to meet and talk and connect and help out as many different people within this community as I possibly could. And eventually, those things start compounding. Eventually, you have a snowball effect where 
finally, after a year and a half, you write something that actually is good. And because for a year and a half, you've been sharing everything you've done. Now, maybe 10 people follow you and they see that one thing that's actually good. And this time they decide to share it. And over that year and a half, you've been talking to this person, that person, this person. And finally, the editor of a magazine knows who you are at this point and finally sees something that's good. And he says, hey, I know that Mark guy. I haven't seen him post stuff for years. Um, this thing's actually pretty good. And all of a sudden, you have an opportunity. And those things, little tiny steps done over and over and over again, build to something that uh, can be pretty great. So I wish there was something more exciting or uh, click worthy that I could tell you. No, but man. It's, it's just that. Yeah, that's perfect. You know, it's, uh, and it's funny, you know, I think, I, I think I've talked about this on the, on the podcast once or twice before. And you've also got to realize like what your goal is, you know, for being in the hunting industry, you know, quote unquote. And it's, I think so often people, immediately think about it like I want to be the next Steve Ranella or I want to be the next Remy Warren and I want to be literally like a guy who is out there hunting for a living to a certain extent you know mm -hmm. I want to be I want that and that's not necessarily what it is there's so many options you know oh, yeah. not everyone's gonna gonna be at that level but you know if you can like for me if if I can work with uh you know, a bunch of different outfitters, guide services, personal brands, building websites and mobile apps and, and helping them manage their marketing. I'm working in the hunting industry effectively. I, like you said, I took my skills, I took what I'm good at and ran with it. Yeah. And so you've got to, you've also got to set your goals and remember that we're not all going to be in front of the camera in the field, you know, 300 days out of the year. Um, <laughs> doing that work there's a big difference for sure and, and i'll also say that's um when you think about why you're wanting to get into it also think about you know is it is it because for a lot of people it's because they want to hunt a lot or they want to fish a lot and they want to like be doing this stuff all the time and i hate to break it to you but for a lot of the people that are in front of the camera or doing this stuff you know like a steve or whoever you're spending a whole heck of a lot of your time not hunting um I can speak to that. Most of my days in front of a computer, most of Steve's days in front of a computer or in meetings, there's a whole lot of baloney that you might not want to do. What, what I just talked to a guy on my podcast named Tony Treach. He wanted to hunt all the time. So he built a company in construction. And so he's able to work, you know, all throughout the spring and summer on his construction business. But once August or September comes, this is his company. He says, you know what? I'm not going to be there. He's got contractors to do everything. And he's got four months to himself and he can hunt all the time and go off on these adventures. He spends a whole lot more time doing this stuff than I am. Um, and he's not in the hunting industry. So, so consider that too. It might not be the best fit if, if what you want to do is spend a ton of time. Now that's not to say that you can spend a lot of time out there. I certainly do than more than some and more than most probably. Um, but you just, every, it's all work, right? No matter what you're going to do, you have to be willing to put in the work and, um, for me, I do it because I'm so passionate. Like, I have this, like I, I already said it before, I have this voice inside of me that just wants to share with the world. I have to talk about this stuff. I have to share my perspective on stuff. I want to try to make a difference on things. And so for me, it was a very natural thing that like, this is what I'm called to do. I, once I started doing it, I very, very quickly realized, oh yeah, this is, this is what I'm supposed to be doing for the rest of my life. Um, I think it's not a bad idea to, to experiment, try different things until you find what that thing is for you um, and chase it. So you generally grew up uh, back East compared uh, in hunting whitetails, correct? That yeah, was kind of your start. Yep. Grew up in Michigan and, and yeah, whitetail deer were the, the main, the main thing here for sure. So what, what inspired you? Cause now you've expanded that significantly. Mm -hmm. um, what inspired you to come out and uh, you know, maybe tell me a little bit about that journey coming from East to West and uh, exploring the rest of what this hunting landscape has to offer. I mean, it's, it's a pretty natural desire for, for a lot of people and not even just hunting, but even just, within the American experience, there's always been a pull, a strong pull for a, for a lot of people to, to head West. West has always represented something within the romantic 
mythology of America. It's, I think it's always kind of represented the wide open, the next opportunity, freedom, a new start, something bigger, better, wilder. Um, and I think that's kind of been the same case within the hunting world. I think when you imagine that next step for someone who grew up east of the Mississippi River, hunting whitetails and turkeys and small game, you you see and you read about these stories of bigger, wilder adventures. And, and for most people, you can't help but want to experience that someday. And And that certainly was the case for me. So yeah, it was for a while, it was intimidating. I didn't think that I had the skill set or the experience to do that kind of thing. Um, while I did grow up in a hunting and outdoorsy family, we were pretty, um, oh, what's the word? Pretty pedestrian outdoor <laughs> family. Um, we didn't do anything big or wild. My, my family was very much like, go to the state park camp, um, go to our cabin and hunt. But my family hunted, you know, hung out the cabin you went out to a tree sat by the tree for a while nobody really knew what they're doing hopefully see something if you see anything you shoot it and then you come back it was a great place to be with family and friends and I had amazing experiences up there but I didn't learn much about becoming a good hunter um, I didn't learn anything about you know really traveling through or surviving or navigating wilderness or planning expeditions or, or anything like that so it wasn't until I graduated college that I started heading west and trying to figure that stuff out on my own. So learned what I needed to know to go backpacking and climbing mountains and eventually chasing elk and stuff like that. Um, and so it was a combination of finally getting the, the gonads to go and try it. Um, and then, you know, taking advantage of the many resources out there today to learn um, what it is you need to be looking for, what it is you need to be doing. Um, but probably the biggest thing is just getting there. I think once I finally took the step to start heading west, um, the very first trip I took, it wasn't a hunting trip. My first trip was hiking and backpacking, that kind of thing. But once you go off into those bigger, wilder pieces of public land and go into grizz country or something like that, you can very quickly realize that this stuff is accessible and available for you and within reach for your average person if you're willing to be smart, put in the work, and, uh, and just go for it. So that was the biggest thing for me. And, uh, you know, every year just want to try new things, go new places, learn more. Um, and I'm absolutely in love with it. So what advice then would you have for someone? You know, I, I, I get a lot of folks that reach out and they say, oh, man, you've inspired me to, you know, I've grown up hunting turkey and whitetail. Um, you've inspired me to finally just sack up and take this trip. I've been thinking about it for 10 years, but, you know, uh, I guess the consequence of failing uh, so spectacularly on your first elk hunt is that it makes a lot of other people feel comfortable to finally uh, take that step. So what advice, um, you know, what maybe differences or things to prepare for or just anything would you give to someone that's like, all right, man, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm. I'm going on my first elk hunt or my first, you know, high country mule deer hunt or whatever that may be. Uh, I mean, there's a million things that we could talk about. Right. Um, but I think that the two most important at a high level would be making sure you're physically prepared because there's nothing that will ruin experience heading out West. Uh, if you're quicker than not being physically prepared. So making sure you're focused on, cardio making sure your lungs and heart and legs are ready to rock and roll um because it's it's not a beauty contest out there so if you've got great pecs and big biceps that's not really going to do much for you um so if you're going on an elk hunt you need to be able to hike you need to be able to go up and down a lot you need to be able to move and, and move and move and move and do that all day for long periods so that's a simple thing you hear about a lot but it's, it's good to make sure that box is checked um because if you can check that box then the rest of it follows but if you can't check that box and you're out there and you're just physically incapable of doing the stuff you want to do well you're in for a very disappointing experience um so check that you don't need to be a superman you don't need to be cameron haynes um but at least make sure you are capable of getting around um secondly i think probably the most important thing is expectations because if you go into this thing thinking you're going to kill a 300 inch bull or any bull or any elk on your first trip or your second trip or your fourth, um, and if you're going out there saying, I got to kill this thing and 
that's, you know, this thing's all about that. I'm going to do everything in the world and I'm going to kill through an inch bowl and it's going to be awesome. And my picture is going to be on Instagram and I'm going to get 700 likes and maybe East Fins will have my picture. If you go into it with that kind of mindset and those uh, expectations, sure, maybe there's some chance that that could happen. You know, miracles happen, <laughs> dreams come true, but 99 times out of 100, it's not. And if you come back from your first Western elk hunting adventure, and you feel like your expectations were not met because you had those and you are disappointed and you're upset with it, then man, you are missing the point. Then you, you I, I feel really, really sad for it because that kind of trip, if you go into it to enjoy the landscape and the process and just the adventure of it, if you can go into it with, with those types of expectations, like I'm going to go out there, I want to see some new country. It's going to be different from home. And I'm stoked to see what that different place looks like. And I'm excited to, to get tired and to work hard and to come back to my tent at night and collapse and not even be able to think for a second because I'm already sleeping. That's what I'm excited about. I'm, I'm excited for the next morning. It's still dark out. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I might see a bull out today. And maybe if I hike to the top of the mountain, maybe I'll get to hear one bugle. And just that anticipation, that excitement, if that is the fun that you're looking forward to, and if that's what you can cherish and enjoy, you're in for a great trip. And hell, maybe you will get that bull. Maybe you'll have some close encounters and all the stars will align and it'll happen. And I hope it does. And that'll be great. But I want everyone to enjoy just the opposite too. Because there's a whole lot of fun to have out there. And um, I think that's the key to a successful trip. If you do that, then the next trip, you'll learn a little bit more. You'll go back. You'll be a little bit better. And if you do that, the next year, you'll come back and you'll get a little bit better. And eventually, you will get your elk. You will get your bull. Um, but you got to start somewhere. So speaking about enjoying the process, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the book. Um, you know, I originally, uh, I had, I think your, your publisher reach out to me. They sent me a copy, uh, way back in, I want to say November. It was right. Uh, it was a couple of weeks before it was scheduled to come out. And, uh, I was like, yeah, I'll check it out. You know, I'll give it a read. And, um, and I, I ate through that thing in the course of just a few days, man. I absolutely loved it. Um, awesome. Thank you. I really loved the mix you had and I'll kind of let you talk a bit more about the book, but I just love the mix you had of, of these anecdotal stories that were fun and funny and they were just, they were really relatable experiences and, you know, so you got that awesome aspect, but then how you tied that in with the, the history of, uh, of these places and how they became what they were. And, and it was just, it was so well balanced, uh, with, with both of those aspects. So I would love for you, maybe just, uh, talk about the book, uh, give an overview kind of what it is and really maybe what inspired you to, to write it. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so the book is that wild country, an epic journey into the past, present and future of America's public lands. And um, a very high level overview of what the book is about is basically, th there's two narrative threads, there's one line, which is examining the history of our public lands, all the different people and events and legislation and conflicts that occurred over the last 150, 200 years that led to us now having 640 some million acres of federal public land available to us and, and examining how that happened, what that means, what you can do in these places, um, and then what's going on right now around them. So that was one side of this. And the second narrative thread was then my own personal experiences, as you just alluded to. I wanted to ground this whole story within my own personal experience. So going to these places, experiencing these places, wrestling with the past and the future and what it might mean if, if we lost some of these places or if these places are allowed to be um, put on the chopping block or degraded in so many different ways. Um, so I wanted to make something that was accessible and enjoyable because there are, you know, there are books that talk about the history of public lands and the, the history of the wilderness movement and the history of conservation. But most all of those are just dense exhausting, hard to read history books that your average guy or girl just isn't going to pick up and get through. Um, so what good is any of this information if no one actually takes it in and learns it and, and is inspired by it? So I want to read, write a book that your average person could enjoy. So that's why I wove these two different storylines together in that way. 
Um, and I'm thrilled to hear that you found that it worked. Um, it's the kind of book that I like to read. So it made it a lot of sense for me to try to write the kind of book that I wanted to read. So that's what the book's about. I went and I hiked and I backpacked and I rafted and I hunted and fished and um, kayaked and did all these different things across the whole country in a bunch of different places that were tied to that informational narrative in different ways. So I went pack rafting and fishing in the Bob Marshall wilderness while discussing some of the interesting events around the progressive area in history in like the twenties, thirties and forties with folks like Eldo Leopold and Bob Marshall and president Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, and why that era was important for public lands. So each chapter had a tie in kind of like that. Now, why was I inspired to write this book? It's uh, it's kind of a twofold thing. As I said earlier in our conversation, you know, right after college, I finally kind of decided to go for it and head west and start experiencing these bigger, wilder places and start backpacking and doing some different things and going on these bigger hunts and fishing trips and whatnot. And very quickly just was smitten with what we have here in America. Um, realize that there's a whole lot of big, wild, insane, amazing country out there that's there for us. And so from that point forward, started spending, you know, whenever I wasn't hunting locally and whenever I had vacation time, I, we were heading west or heading somewhere. Anyway, it wasn't always west. Sometimes it was north or east or south. Um, but heading some big public land to, to hike, camp, backpack, fish, whatever it was. So every year it became more and more and more a part of our lives until um, back in 2014 and 15, we started taking off for months at a time and living out in these places. And so, so I was very almost in bed with these places. They become like foundational to my life. And around that same time, I was also starting to learn about the threats to these places more and more hearing about how folks are trying to get rid of them, how folks are trying to degrade them, how folks are. Um, there's so many different competing interests that want to take advantage of these places. Um, oftentimes for financial reasons, trying to make a buck. And the more I heard, the more concerned I became, uh, eventually got to the point where I, I wanted to do something, had to do something. And at that same time, I'm also building up my career, building Wired to Hunt, building my credentials as a writer. Um, and I was getting more and more to the point where I realized, okay, books in my future. I want, I want to be a, I don't want to write just a book. I want to write a lot of books. That's the... Uh, like my thing is communication. Like we talked earlier, like you find your thing. Well, I realized that my thing is communication. I like to, that like all sorts of different ways. It could be a podcast. It could be speaking in front of people. It could be being on a show or whatever. It could be writing, but the ultimate for me is a book. I'm an absolute bookworm. I love reading books. I've got a lot of books behind me all around my house. Um, that's my thing. And so I knew like the dream was to write a book someday. So I decided, okay, it's time to, time to do it. You're at a point now where you can probably figure out a way to do this thing. So right, those two things were happening at the same time, me getting so concerned and realizing I want to do something about the public land issues and me realizing, Hey, the next step for you in your career is you got to figure out how to write a book. So when those two things met, I realized that's, that's the book. That's how I do these two things. And I saw it as a huge challenge. I saw it as something that I had no right to do. I probably wouldn't be successful Maybe it will fail. Maybe I won't be able to get a publisher. Um, maybe it's going to be horrible. But I decided that I had to try it. And even if it was a complete flop, just doing it, just trying it would be so worthwhile from a personal growth standpoint and from an education standpoint. And it, like taking on that kind of task and finishing it, 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 I just, I remember driving in the car thinking about this and thinking like, even if it's all horrible, it will be a success if you just do it. And so I decided to do it. And uh, a couple of years later, here it is. <laughs> it's, it really is awesome. And I do, I do want to reiterate something you said earlier. I mean, it takes, I mean, we kind of find it somewhat interesting and exciting just because we're already kind of vested in this idea of public lands, but it does take that really dense, dense and somewhat dry to the average person history of of the development of public lands and the establishment of these different wild places um and it does ground it and it makes it relatable and personal and again you just you did such a fantastic job with that you know i i just i loved all the stories and i could picture you guys there you know just ripping fish out of those streams and carrying you know carrying kayaks and yeah or canoes and all this stuff. And, um, 
And then, you know, you go and you look at that same place from a different, you know, a historical perspective. And it's just fantastic. And I really think it's a great book for maybe someone that's looking for, I mean, almost a primer on public lands. Uh, you know, yeah. if somebody's new to all of this and, and is like, okay, you know, I keep seeing all these public landowner t-shirts. I keep hearing everybody talk about this topic. I get the idea behind it, but I, w- I want to learn more. I mean, I would, I would hand them a copy of your book in an instant. It's absolutely fantastic from that perspective. So, oh, thank you. I, I appreciate you saying that, and um, that's that's exactly what I was hoping it would be able to do. Is is that it could be that primer, that foundation that someone would actually want to read that they could get through, and then on the other side, they would be a whole lot more educated. They're not going to be the ultimate expert on it. We're not going into every detail of it. Um, but they'll have a basic foundational knowledge of what's going on out there and they'll be inspired to get out there themselves. If those two things can happen after reading this book, then I did my job and I've just been super thrilled and thankful to have heard from a lot of people that, that seem to feel that way. So if somebody was looking to take a journey kind of like yours, where would you recommend they, they started? Uh, if, if they're like anywhere, anywhere in the U S I want to hit, I want to hit Mark's top three. What, what mm. would they be? I'm going to make Man, you pick a, a favorite, a, favorite child right now. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, so I will lean into my biases. I'll lean into my, my favorites here. I would tell you to, and let's just say you're coming from the East just because more people are coming from the East. Head West on 80. And then loop up 94 into North Dakota and hit Theodore Roosevelt National Park because there's just this tremendous connection to Theodore Roosevelt and everything he did within the store of public lands. And the badlands of North Dakota and South Dakota are just such a spectacular landscape. The Great Plains meets like a miniature, um, I don't want to say miniature Grand Canyon because it's much, much more miniature than that. But these beautiful, cool canyons and buttes and river bottoms And then the sweeping grasslands up above um, and you feel so small in the midst of these big, wild, wide horizons. So hit Theodore Roosevelt National Park and then continue west and then get to the GYE, the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, and just do a a tour of that area. So I'm going to tell you to go through the National Forest there that's on the north side. Um, So there's going to be the Absorca mountain range the bear tooth mountains right there maybe a good way to go go up the bear tooth highway yes this is what you should do go up the bear tooth highway <laughs> and you're going to go up onto this incredible plateau you're going to be up like i don't know what it is ten thousand feet above tree line you can drive up to the there it's, it's the most accessible above tree line place um i know of other than another road in colorado um drive up there unbelievable fishing in some of these little alpine tarns up there you can camp in a number of places, national forests. So you can just pull off the road in a lot of spots and camp. Um, and this road takes you right into the northeast entrance to Yellowstone. So you're going to come off the, the Beartooth Highway. It's going to drop you down into the northeast corner of Yellowstone. And it's going to take you into the, the Lamar Valley. And the Lamar Valley is my favorite part of Yellowstone. Um, this is these huge, wide open, grassy valleys with a river running through the middle and then great big mountains on either side and because of a whole slew of different factors these valleys support immense wildlife populations so this is where you're going to see your hundreds or thousands of buffalo sweeping through this valley this is where you're going to see wolves this is where you're going to see grizzlies walking the edges of the timber um i I told a story of one of these hikes that did in the in the lamar valley um in the book Uh, there's also another little another offshoot of that called Slough Creek, which is just off of the Lamar Valley. And that was the, the scene of another chapter in the book where I went on a fishing trip and backpacking trip with my wife. So hit Lamar Valley, maybe slip in a little Slough Creek fish in there, continue your way across Yellowstone, see all the sites. Um, the biggest thing I would tell you about Yellowstone is do not get sucked into just the road tour because most everyone just does the road tour. They drive around, they step out of the car, they walk 50 yards, they see a geyser, they go back to the truck. They go drive somewhere else, get out of the car, go get a souvenir. You're going to be overwhelmed with a lot of people, a lot of tourists, a lot of traffic jams. That's not the cool part of Yellowstone. The cool part of Yellowstone is parking at a trailhead and hiking in a few miles. And then very quickly, what's unique about Yellowstone 
compared to a lot of other national parks is that as soon as you get off of the road, you get in a half mile or a mile away from a trailhead, there's nobody there. There's very, very little hiking pressure in Yellowstone compared to a national park like Rocky Mountain National Park or Yosemite National Park. You go in those places and go on a hiking trail, some of the trails, the popular ones, you're going to be surrounded by people the whole way. Um, in Yellowstone, I don't know many places like that. Almost everything, you're going to be on your own, which is great. So, so tour through Yellowstone, stop along the way, hike some spots, explore some spots, um, and then end through the south entrance, which will take you to my third recommendation, which is Grand Teton National Park. And Grand Teton is, is the, the pinnacle of the national park system for me personally, at least. Um, I think it's the most iconic visual mountain range in the United States. The Tetons are just mind blowing. I think you can't ever look at them and not be in awe. Um, the Tetons are on the cover of my book. So if you pick up the book and look at it, you'll see what I'm talking about. Just a, just a gorgeous place with incredible recreational opportunities from hiking and camping and fishing to bike riding to boating. It's all there. Um, I had, this was the first place that my wife and I went on our big Western, our first big Western trip. It's where we returned to every summer. It's where we rented our little cabin for months on end for a lot of those years. It was just outside the Tetons. It's where I proposed to my wife on top of a mountain. Um, so it holds a lot of personal uh, connections for me, but I think, um, I think anyone can very quickly establish their own connection to a place like that. So, so that's my one, two, three. That was absolutely perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. I love it. Uh, so as we're winding down, uh, we, we talked, I feel like we kind of touched on this topic a, a little bit, but I may phrase it a different way. Um, you know, say maybe you're out on one of these hiking trails or something and, and you run into someone, y'all maybe sit down to grab a snack and you're talking and they find out that you hunt. And maybe this person looks at you and says, you know, I've always been interested in hunting. Always thought it was cool. I've wanted to do it, but I don't have any friends that do it. I don't have any family that does it. I have zero background in it. And I think I'm a little intimidated by this. I don't think it's something I can do. What words of wisdom or advice would you give a, give a person like that? Yeah. Um, I think I would first tell them, um, you know, to, to, to connect with some community. I think that more than any other resource, I could point you to podcasts. I could point you to books or websites where you can get a lot of information. Um, but I think probably the most important thing is connecting with a community in some way, because more than anything, a real person taking you to their stream or to their mountain or to take in their backyard or someone sitting down with you and talking about these things or inviting you along for a trip or, or just being able to be there to spitball and, and answer your questions um, or to say, Oh yeah, that thing you thought you're doing right. No, it's, it's this way. Um, I don't, it's really hard to substitute a physical real mentor of some kind. And, and the, the easiest way to get a mentor of some kind is to connect with the community. Um, so it depends on where your interests lie, where you reside, all those things. But um, for example, if you want to get into hunting public land for well, really anything, backcountry hunters and anglers is a great community to tap into. If you live out east and you're particular interest in deer hunting, connect with the Quality Deer Management Association. If you think that ducks are where it's at and you just for whatever reason have been fascinated with ducks and would love to hunt some ducks, well, check out Ducks Unlimited. All these organizations have local chapters. So small groups of folks all across the country that have different local events and they're wide armed, wide open arms saying, Hey, come on in. And all of a sudden you join, you show up for the first meeting and you'll meet people and you can tell them your story, tell them where you're from, tell them you're new, tell them you're interested. And, and I guarantee there's some people that will step up to help out, invite you to the next get together, um, show you around, take a walk, whatever it might be. So that's step number one. It, it, it takes a little bit of courage to go out and do something like that, um, to put yourself out there. But I don't think you'll ever be disappointed um, because I do believe in the inherent goodness of a lot of people out there. There are good people out there that will help out if, uh, if you put yourself out there to meet them. So that'd be step number one. And then step number two, I guess I will point you to a few, a few sort of resources. And I'm going to very selfishly say, check out what we got going on at Meat Eater. The Mediator TV show is, is about as inspiring and, and welcoming of a video product out there. If you want to kind of learn what hunting and fishing is all about and um, 
and, and kind of get a feel for it. It's hard to beat that. It's on Netflix. Check out the Meteor TV show. And if that still draws you in, you can check out all the other resources we have. And there's so many other great podcasts and shows and articles, podcasts like this. Um, there's a tremendous trove of information across the web these days. So dig into it. If you're, if you're loving it, dig into it. And then just, just get outside and play around. Try this stuff. It goes back to the expectations thing we talked about in the beginning. Don't feel like you need to go out there knowing everything. Don't feel like you shouldn't start hunting until you are confident with what you're doing. Don't feel like you shouldn't go out there until you know how to make this thing happen. Go out there and explore. Go out there for a day and say, you know what, today I'm just going to look for deer tracks. See if I can find some deer tracks. Maybe today I'm just going to walk around this piece of public land. And in all the other times I've ever gone out, I've always just hiked this trail. Maybe today I'm not going to hike on the trail. I'm going to go off trail. I'm just going to walk around and look and see if I can see animals. Um, that stuff's a lot of fun. And that is how you slowly build a foundation to becoming a hunter. If you do those three things, uh, you'll slowly get there. All right. So if folks wanted to find you online and follow along with the adventures, where can they, uh, where can they find the podcast? Where can they pick up the book? Where can they follow you? Yeah. So the book, uh, you know, available most any place you can get books. Uh, Amazon of course is pretty ubiquitous. So check out that wild country on Amazon or wherever you want to get one. Um, really appreciate people doing that. And then if you search for wired to hunt, that's going to be where you'll find most all of my stuff across the different platforms. So that's my handle on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. That's, uh, uh, that's where a lot of the information is. And then uh, meat eater, the, the meat eater.com is where my writing is most of my articles these days. And that's also where you will find our new show, which is the back 40, um, which is on the meteor YouTube channel. So check it all out. All right, y'all, make sure you head on over there, check out the book. I'll make sure to link to all of those on the show notes pages. Uh, Mark, thanks so much for taking the time to hop on today. I really appreciate your time. Hey, you're welcome. It was fun. Thanks, Sam. All right, y'all, that'll do it for this episode of The Wild Initiative. Make sure you check out the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com. Another big thank you to Mark for hopping on. That'll do it for this week, but until next week, I hope this episode inspired you to get involved, get outdoors, and plan your initiative for the wild. Thank you for listening to The Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from the Wild Initiative family, and more. 